We are continuing in our study in John, chapter 7. You need your Bibles open, and you need to have your heads in gear here. I would like you to make some observations this morning as we uh, prepare to analyze this chapter. Where was Jesus in chapter 6, the beginning of the chapter, when he fed 5,000 people? Where was he, location-wise? East of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and the second half of the chapter, where did he end up doing his, where he spoke his things? Trace. On the other side, on the west, particularly in Capernaum. All right. The theme of John chapter 6 was the theme. Provider, sustainer for life. Okay, He provides, he sustains physical life. He provides food for the body. He provides protection for the body. And at the end of the chapter, when he was discussing things with his disciples after many of them left, what uh, did he stress that he was capable of providing? Yes, uh, he has the words of spiritual life. Right? That was the words of life. To whom will we go, Peter said. You know, no one else has this, only you. And so, regardless of the place, or even regardless of the audience, the same theme runs through the entirety of chapter 6. There are a number of breaks in the chapter, but that's the cohesive theme. Now we come to chapter 7. Where do we find Jesus in the first verse? Galilee. So obviously there has been a passage of time. Right? Chapter 6 ended with Jesus in um, Capernaum. And uh, now he's in Galilee with his brothers. Where did Jesus live? We presume. Everything we know points to, the, to Nazareth. And so... There is a definite break between the chapters. How long it is, we have no idea. There is a time element uh, indicated here. What is what does the whole chapter revolve around? Yes, the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, verse 2, and um, verse 10, that his brothers left to go, you know, went south, that is going uphill to the feast to, to be held in Jerusalem. Verse 14, we find Jesus in the middle of the feast. What do you mean in the middle of the feast? How long was the Feast of Tabernacles? It was a week, right? Seven days long or eight days long. And where in the Bible do we have to go to find out what was practiced on the Feast of Tabernacles? Anybody have any idea where the feasts of Israel were recorded? Leviticus chapter 23, so let's go back and read it, All right? Just for a little bit of background information. Leviticus. Verse, let's just start reading from verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So apparently... Each of these feasts mentioned is a week's duration. Right? This is a general overview. Take a week long, the last day is a Sabbath. No work to be done. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at evening is the Lord's Passover, and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Isn't that what this one is? Oh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. 
That's the end of the chapter. Verse 33, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you. So this one was actually eight days long. And ye shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord as a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, and a meal offering, and a sacrifice, and drink offering, everything upon his day, beside the, beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside your free will offerings, which ye shall give to the Lord. And also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye shall have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days, and ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. Kids probably love this. You get to sit in a fort all week long. Okay? All that are Israelites born shall dwell in your booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. So tell me, what was the significance of the Feast of Tabernacles? What was it? Okay, it was a memorial of... Okay, good. A memorial of redemption. Sort of a uh, parallel to the Passover and the unleavened bread. Okay? Although the Passover and the unleavened bread focus more on the, the cost of redemption, the necessity of sacrifice blood, right? Sacrificial lamb. And purification. This one simply looks back on the fact that God provided for their needs, right? That He was their bow, if you will, that uh, overshadowed them and protected them, provided for their needs. It's also, as uh, Schofield points out, uh, not only commemorative but prophetic as well. It looks forward to the day when Israel will be regathered from the nations into the land as the prophets predicted and that they would once again dwell under the direct authority and provision of the Lord. Right? So the fifteenth day of the seventh month this is uh, actually the beginning of the uh, re the civil calendar. The civil year began with the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Right? Why? Why the civil year? The religious calendar began with the Passover, which was hearkening back to the Exodus. Right? That's really when, as a nation, these people were set apart for the Lord. So that's appropriate for their religious calendar to begin with the Passover. Why is it appropriate for their civil calendar halfway through, beginning of the seventh month? Why is it appropriate that that begins with the same sort of thing? That's right. That's when they became a nation, right? Civilly, you know, this is when they were separated. You know, prior to that, they were a family, right? When Jacob and his sons went down into Egypt, they were just a family, and then they were a horde of slaves. And then when God separated, now they became a nation, right? Still unorganized, but nevertheless a nation. So, the feast of Tabernacles was uh, one of those major feasts that all Jewish families were required to have a representative from at the temple in Jerusalem. Very significant feast. And as you can, uh, as you read through this, you're, the people were expecting somebody from Jesus' family to be there. Verse uh, 10 and 11, when his brothers were gone up, then went Jesus also up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? 
Um, they were expecting him to be there. So, essentially, the seventh chapter of John covers eight days. Eight days. Chronology. We can date it. You know, we can place it precisely. It begins with the 15th day of the month Tishri and extends for the, for the next eight days. Before we get into it this morning, tell me what the twofold subdivision of chapters 2 through 12 in John is. We've talked about this many times. Chapters 2 through 12 is the section in John on public, Jesus' public ministry. Yes, the manifested signs of the Son in public. Now, what was the twofold subdivision of that into which these various chapters fall? Remember, Tracy? Yeah, 2 through 4, and then 5 through 12. No, all of these things were done in the presence of his disciples. Chapters 2 through 4 is a period of general reception. Generally, we have a favorable, favorable, favorable response to Christ in Cana, where he did his first miracle, down in Jerusalem, where he cleansed the temple. Even then, they didn't do anything really to him. Chapter 3, Nicodemus is there talking to him. Right? Chapter 4, we have the Sycharites all turn to him. As soon as we come to chapter 5, what do we see? For the first time, somebody tried to kill him. Right? So, starting in chapter 5 and running increasingly through chapter 12, we find divided reaction. All right? Divided reaction. And let's just trace that for a moment. We have seen it in chapter 5 where some of the Jews tried to kill him and Jesus had to defend himself. The only person that probably believed Christ that day was uh, who? <laughs> chapter 5. All right, his immediate followers plus the guy that he healed. All right. Chapter 6, the feeding, the feeding of the 5,000 and then the subsequent discourse in Cana or Capernaum. Who were the believers in that particular day? Lots of people followed him. Uh, we have his immediate disciples. But it, it, even at the end of that chapter, that was a dividing point in Jesus' public ministry that many of his own professed followers fell away. Right? So we have division even amongst his disciples in chapter 6. Now we come to chapter 7. And uh, the chapter opens with, with someone else divided. Who is divided about Christ? Just take a little scan there. The first uh, chapter seven, verses one to nine. Read through that. What people? Jesus is not even in the temple in the first nine verses of the chapter. Yeah, his own family is divided. Okay. In fact, they, it was him against them. <laughs> Right? They were, at this point, his whole family was unbelievers, except perhaps his mother and his father, but his own brothers didn't. They didn't have anything to do with him. They thought he was... Well, you can. this is a perfect parallel to what episode back in the Old Testament? Joseph and his brothers. They were unbelievers, denying his claims. Right? And so the seventh chapter develops this further that we see even in Jesus' family there was rejection and then as you've pointed out the chapter does focus then on the division among the people and even among the leadership among the authorities in Jerusalem they were divided this is a very important chapter then because we know from chapter 5 there has been widespread opposition but we don't know precisely who now we come to this chapter and we find it that there are believers in just about every strata of Jewish society. There are believers among the common folk. There are believers among the officers of the guard. There are believers, a minimal number of believers, even among the leaders of the Jewish people, and also detractors in each of those elements. And that's why this chapter, one of the reasons why the seventh chapter is so significant. 
what I want to do is just uh, never mind with the um, the data that tell the story here because you're quite capable now I think of doing that of finding that stuff I want to focus on the topic of this chapter and there are a number of references in chapter 7 to the works of Jesus Christ let's read those verses in which Jesus stresses his works I believe this is one of the sub themes of the chapter that indicates what we have all right verse 3 um, Tracy Can you read that please Brethren therefore said unto him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that thy, that thy disciples also may see the works of thy hands. Okay, sneering, sneering sort of caustic remark. Why don't you go somewhere else and show your works? Verse 4. There is no man that doeth anything in secret, that he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show yourself in the Lord. Yeah. You know, they were, they were sort of suggesting, you know, Oh, you're really a somebody, eh? Well, if you're really such a hot shot, why don't you go show yourself, you know? Make a big deal. Why don't you, why don't you get some advertising? <laughs> right? This is so good. Do something about it. Right? Next verse, uh, verse 17. See? <laughs> Any man will do God's will. So this is Jesus speaking, right? Stressing doing again. Also, verse 21, Chris. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work and you marvel. To which is he referring here? I have done one, mar one work and you people are all marveling. Yeah. He's referring to the episode in John chapter 5. Right? Now, it wasn't quite a year before because uh, it was about uh, what uh, Passover begins the. Yeah, but this is the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh seventh month, and Passover is in the uh, first month, so it's yeah six months before. Okay, but anyway, you got you got the idea. First time he's been in Jerusalem that we know of, according to John. So six months later, these people were, uh, you know, Jesus brings it up again. You know, that thing that I did back then, that was a significant point. You know, I did a work here, right? Uh, what verse that, was that, 21? 23. The man on the Sabbath day received circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken in you. Are you angry with me? Because I have made the man entirely wrong in the Jesus is drawing a, an argument in support of his working on on the Sabbath day. The Jews practiced circumcision. That was a work <laughs> on the Sabbath day. Okay. What's, what's worse, breaking the law by circumcising somebody to keep the law or uh, saving a man's life? If you ever get a chance to read a historical biography called Sons of Thunder, it's a biography done on uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Historical fiction. You know, it's a story built up on, on the basis of the Gospels, and, and the author does a pretty good job of reaching into the psyche of the Jewish, the average Jewish person. And John was quite an arguer, you know, in, in, in the, the novel. There are, there are certain grounds. Remember the one time Jesus uh, was rejected by some people and, and it was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, that came up to him and said, why don't you call down fire out of brimstone out of heaven and just you know, grease these people? <laughs> this is, gives us a little clue into the personality of, of John, the apostle of love, you know, quote unquote. He became the apostle of love when he became a mature Christian, but I think as a young man he was anything but the sensitive, concerned sort of person. And, he was, and in, I remember, it has been years since I read that biography, uh, that um, this is one thing that John threw up in his father's face, you know, at one time or something. This was a standing issue amongst 
the Orthodox, you know, just what can you do? What is it wrong to do on the Sabbath day? And he talks about, well, if your neighbor's ox fell in a hole on the Sabbath day, if you, are you going to just leave the ox there and let it die? Or are you going to do a good work on the Sabbath day, save its life? The responses to that would have divided the Jews. It's sort of the same thing that Jesus refers to here about this one work that he did. And he's defending himself. Also, he refers to his works in 31. Blair? For many of the people who believe in him, and he said, he said, when Christ comes, he will do more miracles than these. This man, right? Will he do more miracles than these? Quantity of miracles seems to be the thing that was impressing some of these Jewish observers. Look at all these miracles. Undoubtedly, some of these people were probably with Jesus up in Galilee, <coughs> right? The nobleman's son, the feeding of the 5,000, right? Perhaps even there, so, you know, maybe the odd one was there at the uh, marriage feast, right? Many miracles. We, we know that Jesus did more miracles when he was in Jerusalem just before Nicodemus. Before he healed the impotent man, remember that? He said he, did, he said he did many miracles and the people would have made him a king. Right? So there's no doubt that there are a number of miracles that John does not even specifically record that perhaps we find in the other Gospels that, that fit in to the narrative. And this was impressing some of the people. All these miracles. Wow. 51. Last reference to the works of Jesus in this chapter. See? Our law judge any man before hear him and know what he does. Jewish law was supposed to take into account the actual deeds, not just the stories about what a person was doing, right? You're supposed to analyze the facts, not just testimony. So there are half a dozen references in this chapter to Jesus' works. There are even more references to his words. Let's run these references. Verse 7, uh, Tracy, 12, Blair, 14, Steve. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates because I testify of it, and its works are evil. I testify against the, wor the world that its works are evil, Jesus said. 14? Uh, but he talked. 17. Oh, did I say 17? 15, sorry. Right? Verse 16, my doctrine is not mine, Jesus said, but his that sent me. If any man wills to do God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, that is of my doctrine, what Jesus was teaching, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So this was basic, you know, Jesus himself was raising the issue, you're either going to believe me or you're not going to believe what I say. Last night I was in the office and uh, Brenda Jonah came up and talked to me and uh, she said, how do we know that this book is right? You know, like, how come there are so many other religious religions? And how come there's so many other cults and all these people? It's, it real, really bothers her. There's so many detractors to the faith. And how do we, how do we know that we're right? <coughs> They're wrong. And it boils down to the book. Right? It boils down to the teaching. So give me a good chance to talk to her about it. This is really where the issue still lies today. It hasn't changed, really. Maybe some of the formats have changed, but the same basic issue is still fundamentally there. Verse 26. Who, who's next? Though he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him, do the rulers know that indeed this is the very 
Jesus wasn't shy. He was speaking boldly. Verse 35. And to the Jews among yourselves, where will you go? And we shall not find it. Will you go into the first among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Verse 36 as well. Jesus said, uh, you shall seek me. What men are saying is this, that he said, you shall seek me and, I, and shall not find me. So they're alluding to the specific teaching that Jesus said that he was going to leave. Right? 40 and 46. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, and there, this is a reference specifically back to the contents of verses 37 to 39, prediction of the Holy Spirit. When they heard this saying, they said, of a truth, this is the prophet. The officers concluded, never man spoke like this man. So there is a twofold emphasis as usual. This is not new we, we see it all the way through john that there's an emphasis on the works of jesus what he did and also what he said but i don't believe even that is sufficient to nail down what the theme of chapter 7 is because that's something that we've seen all the way through i believe what is emphasized in this chapter is the word no In chapter 6, the, um, the people were divided a little bit, but they didn't, uh, there's not much of an emphasis on knowing. I think maybe one or two references. Um, in verse 42, the people had said when Jesus was in the in the synagogue in, in Capernaum, the people said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? I believe that's the only reference to people knowing anything in the chapter. Right? We come to chapter 7 and there is a dramatic emphasis on knowing. Look at some of these references. Verse 4, Jesus, brothers, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. I believe that the reason that John put this little episode between Jesus and his brothers at the, at the beginning of this seventh chapter is because it raises an issue that becomes a dominant theme in the, in the following week. When Jesus was down in Jerusalem. Up to this point, people in Jerusalem have been introduced to Jesus. They know, they think they know a little bit. They know at least that he's a miracle worker. They know that he is run amok with the traditions of the Jewish faith. The oral faith. But they really don't know anything about him. Now it's coming to a head. And Jesus is going to say, he's going to show them that they really don't know anything. They think they know. And the more they get to know about him the more it divides, see? And this, this business of coming to a more precise knowledge of Christ, I think, is the theme of chapter 7. And it's the stage is set in a discussion with his brothers. They said, show yourself so, people you will, you, so you'll be known. That's the idea. Show yourself so that you will be known. I think that's the theme. Verse 10, when his brothers were gone up, then Jesus went up, unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. It's almost as if he's trying not to be known. The point is, is it wasn't quite the time. However, three days into the feast, or four days into the feast, Jesus uh, blew all that and uh, opened his mouth and publicly taught. The, the Jews' immediate response was, how does this man know anything? He was never taught. How does he know? He, how does he know? 
Jesus responds in verse 17, if any man wills to do God's will, if you're really a spiritually minded person, you have the proper desires, that, that kind of a person shall know the teaching, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself, if it just be a man's word or whether it's divine. And he uses gnosko there. You'll know by experience. You'll really have a discernment. You shall know the teaching. Look at verse. Look at the emphasis in 26 to 29. But lo, the people said of Jesus, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the, do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? The people obviously have come to a conclusion. We know who this is. Nevertheless, we know this man from where he is. But when Christ comes, no man knows from where he is. There's a real play on words here. Gnosko is used in verse 26 and the second part of verse 27. Do the rulers know personally, by experience, that this is the very Christ? That's Gnosko, the deep knowledge. Have they really come to grips with this? And in verse 27, the Jewish multitudes were claiming knowledge, oida, a general idea. Nevertheless, we know, we have a general idea about this man from where he is. Actually, Jesus contradicted their claim in verse 28. But when Christ comes, these people said, no man knows from where he is. No man must, must have been a tradition of the Jewish people that Messiah, nobody would really know too much about Messiah. They might know some facts, but not really know his origins. Well, Jesus' response to this was, you both know me. You have a general idea, oida, and you know from where I am, a general idea, oida, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. And Jesus used oida there again. He says, you people don't even have an idea of who he is, the one that sent me. You don't even know him. But I know him. And Jesus said, I have a general idea. For I am from him, and he sent me. So Jesus confronted their claims to knowledge. It came to a head again at the end of the chapter, verses 48 to 51, or to 52. This time it's not just the people, but it's the rulers and the leaders with Jesus. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him, was the question. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Now, the leaders are sitting in judgment on the popular opinions being formed about Christ. The man in the street was becoming convinced that this really was the Messiah. You know, he, they were claiming knowledge. And the, and the clergy, as it were, were sitting in judgment on the laity and saying, these people are just stupid. They don't really know. This is Gnosko in verse 49. They don't really know. They don't really know what they're talking about. They don't know their theology. Nicodemus said unto the, in response, does our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he does? And, and Nicodemus uses appropriately the word gnosko here, to know by experience, to know in depth. You know, the function of the law is really not to sit in superficial judgment on hearsay. Let's find out what this man's about. That's the implication. That's a principle of law that you're really supposed to get to the bottom of it before you sit, sit in judgment. And the Jews, Jewish leaders in response said, well, are you from Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. This is an allusion to Micah, you know, that from Bethlehem, Ephrata, would the prophet arise. Okay? So they thought that they understood, but they really didn't know. And this business of knowing the Lord comes up again in chapter 8. Tremendous emphasis on it. In fact, I personally believe that chapters 7, 8, and 9 and the first part of chapter 10 are very closely related as far as themes go. Um, 
the the business of really knowing Christ or not knowing him and what you need to know about him is something that's stressed in all of chapter 7, all of chapter 8. In fact, the word know is used probably 20 times in chapter 8. We come to chapter 9, another dozen times that's stressed. Chapter 10, Jesus gives the parable about the shepherd and the sheep and the sheep know the shepherd's voice. You know, it's just, it comes all the way through these these next three chapters. So I think that we have a, a theme that is a dominant concept and it's beginning to be emphasized now. Where is Jesus? He's in Jerusalem. He's in the temple at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right. I'm at Feast of Tabernacles. We come to chapter 10. The next major time reference is... 10.22, and it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter. Right? So between chapter 8 and chapter 10, we have a time period, Feast of Dedication. Uh, does anybody know what that is? Feast of Dedication? Well, there's, there's a good assignment for it. Okay, just put it down. I need to look it up too. Find out uh, for next class. About the Feast of Dedication. Write it up. Uh, this is re re referenced in uh, John 10.22. Find out uh, what kind of a, an interval of time, of elapsed time, we see between chapter 8 and chapter 10. And that will be helpful. We'll be able to see just how closely related these chapters are. March 8, 10. So from the references in John chapter 8 that we've looked at about Christ being known, I would say that this gives us a pretty good clue as to the theme of this chapter. I think that what we have here is Christ unveiling himself. He's already... In this chapter, he's harked back to that ma first major miracle that he did in John chapter 5, about six months previous. And he's using that as a, a springboard to challenge the people that they can know him. They're going to have to pay attention to what he's saying. And there are claims to truth in this chapter. There are, oh, I don't know. Um, oh, wait. That's in chapter 8. We're in chapter 7. Um If you're going to know me, Jesus said there are certain things. You have to uh, judge righteous judgment, verse 24. You've got to actually listen to the scriptures and not to your oral tradition. You've got to listen to my claims. He says, I'm predicting that I'm going to go away and you people are going to be limited. And so now is the time for you to know. If you're going to know me, you'll have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. These are the major themes of this chapter. So the sign of John chapter 7, if we had to pick a sign for it, I think Jesus is unveiling himself. He is the unknown. Um, the sign of the unknown Christ, the unknown prophet. I think that's what it is. They did it, the people in this chapter didn't know his origins. They didn't know where he, he was presently from. They didn't know his destiny. 
They didn't know the validity of his claims. They just didn't know. <laughs> and that's really stressed in this chapter. People did not know. Let me just read a couple of statements just to solidify that. Verse 26, the implication in the people's minds is that the, their own leaders didn't know about Christ. Do the, do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? The people claim to know Christ here, but their tradition is alluded to when they say, no man, when Christ comes, no man knows from where he is. Jesus, evaluating their own claims to know him, said, you know not. And at the end of the chapter, uh, the rulers, evaluating their own people, said, this people do not know. And Nicodemus was essentially charging the leaders themselves with not knowing. So that's the emphasis. People and leadership do not know Christ. Christ was claiming that it's possible to know him. And I think that's the theme of the chapter. This chapter highlights Jewish ignorance of Christ. It emphasizes Christ's efforts to illuminate them by self-revelation of his own knowledge, by argument and exhortation. And as a natural result, we have a division among the people and the leadership based on what they think they know. All right? So we have a, a major development of the drama, of the progression in the experience of the people. Now, let me give you an outline to the chapter. And we'll work our way through it. Now, if you look at this sheet, uh, you'll notice that uh, I have highlighted, I think, what are the dominant themes in the chapter for you, giving you some observations chronologically, geographically, and biographically just to tell the story. And those references to knowing, uh, I think those are the most important references right there. That's, that's the ones that you should become familiar with in this chapter, and they lead to the theme. On the second side of the page, you will have an outline for the chapter. We're going to look at it this way. I think the first nine verses show us the rejection of Christ's signs and wonders by his own brethren, his own family, who were ignorant of what he had done. This took place up in Galilee. It says that in verse 1. But when we come to verse 10, to the end of the chapter, we find Jesus in Jer Jerusalem. So we have Galilean rejection of Christ based on ignorance in the first nine verses, and we have Judean controversy over Christ's claims and teachings in the remainder of the chapter, based on ignorance again. People basically did not know. Now this uh, second division is the major portion of the chapter, verses 10 to 53, and it divides into three sections. You have general difference of opinion. I think we have three movements in the chapter. The first movement, 10 to 13, is prior to the feast, or at the very beginning of the feast. Uh, his brothers were down, Jesus goes down, the Jews are looking for him. Um, they, they, Jesus is sort of, he's there, but he's not publicly showing himself, right? So the first movement, right? Then in verses 14 to 31, this section, it says that about the middle of the feast, um, Jesus broke his silence and began to preach publicly. And he defends himself and he challenges their claims to know where Messiah comes from. And he challenges that they don't really know. And the end result of this, I'll just read it in 30 to 31. Then they sought to take him. But no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come, and many of the people believed on him. This is divided reaction here. And the people said, when Christ comes, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? So this is Jesus at the middle of the feast, defending himself among the populace. 
challenging their misconceptions about the Messiah. So we have a decisive difference of opinion in the middle of the feast. The third major movement in this chapter begins with verse 32 and ends at the end, where you have a mutinous difference of opinion at the last of the feast. Now it's Jesus and the Pharisees and the people. And um, it starts out with the Pharisees sending chief priests and officers.